Hello everyone. So, um, welcome to the third and final um, video lecture of this week. Um, we're focusing on the art of the Akkadian Kingdom again and in the last two lectures are focused on the idea of the public monument which is very uh, much of a contemporary topic these days and I'd like to dedicate our discussion on Thursday specifically on the idea of the public monument. However, we can study the Akkadian Kingdom um, with um, its other aspects as well um, and I'd like to use this lecture this final um, video lecture to talk about the material and visual culture of the Akkadian Kingdom um, from a different perspective. Um, but, I, but let me um, review a few concepts that we have covered in the last two lectures um, and these concepts are really key for us to use um, in moving forward in the, uh, in the future weeks as well. And I start with narrative. Um, so what is narrative? And, and I want to complement my thoughts with, um, with Irene Winter's argument about um, uh, what na narrative is. Um, so narrative is a convention, basically, a convention of representation presenting an account of the past. Uh, it's not the only convention. Uh, it's one of the options. In a narrative, events like war or a building of a project are linked in a cause-effect relationship um, that they do not inherently possess. Um, so in a narrative, uh, you will hear Akkadian kings talking about, I won this war, I went and conquered this landscape, conquered this country, and I came back and I built a temple. Right, and so the cause-effect relationship is not necessarily uh, an inherent part of that history, uh, but they make that connection by actually linking them in, in the text, in the um, in the narrative, or in the monument itself. Um, so we have pictorial and textual narratives, and it's important to know those. Secondly, um, the, the idea of narrativizing is precisely this operation of connecting, uh, uh, connecting events that are not necessarily, not inherently linked um, in a historical operation that retells the past in a narrative form. So it's an imposition of a particular convention to relationships in the past, to relationships between events that are not otherwise there and we call this narrativizing storytelling by connecting the threads right um, ideology is another concept that we uh, talked a little bit about in the previous two lectures um, ideology is interesting because it's oftentimes associated with a kind of a negative political attitude um, but it's, ideology is basically an established dialogue, a so, social transaction um, that needs to have audience. Um, so without audience, ideology cannot um, really work. That's why it's a cultural discourse that is delivered in the form of a complex worldview. Ideologies are everywhere um, and they're not always oppressive. They don't need to be oppressive. It's a power discourse that's everywhere, um, and it's not, its difference from propaganda is very important because ideology only functions when there is a receptive audience for it and it receives a positive feedback. And that's why how the ideology sort of really gets established. It's not, that's why ideology is often produced by that audience itself. It's not simply produced by the elites. Um, so I'd like to really complicate this concept of ideology a little bit. It's a kind of a political discourse that, um, that is established as a kind of a dialogue and encounter rather than a one-way um, communication as it is in propaganda. That's how it is different. Um, and commemorative monument is a public monument um, that presents an official version of history to the public. 
And the idea is that this is presented as something that is shared, um, as um, in a way negating and leaving out other perspectives, um, so which can be uh, rather uh, problematic. In West Asia, we have commemorative monuments that take the form of steles, uh, rock reliefs, inscribed statues, obelisks, and a whole um, range of um, objects, monuments that are uh, placed in the public sphere. They present visual and verbal narratives about the past. Um, and so, um, but um, then one striking uh, aspect of Akkadian rule um, is that we see a sudden, uh, actually, flood of telling stories, um, particularly mythological stories, um, uh, and um, uh, and I mentioned in the uh, in the last two lectures that the introduction of Akkadian as a as a um, as a language actually had a great impact. Um, all of these suppressed, previously suppressed narratives kind of really surfaced in the, into the public sphere. And uh, in one way that these stories actually surfaced into the public sphere um, was the form of, um, uh, was in the form of cylinder seals. Um, and so in <clears throat> these cylinder seals became a really interesting medium uh, through which mythological tales are told. So in this particular uh, seal, cylinder seal, we see dated to the Akkadian Empire, uh, both by inscription um, and in terms of its style, um, we see um, uh, it taking a really important role for storytelling. This is a green-colored serpentine seal, um, and it is um, now in the Lure Museum. The seals um, then, um, uh, the seal has um, uh, like in this one, it, they take on a kind of a mythological, mythical storytelling role. Um, and this becomes a kind of a really, um, uh, the iconography of various gods and divinities and heroes and divine beings then becomes standardized. A new vocabulary uh, is really developed. We see here two kneeling heroes um, with vases in, in their hands and water is coming out of them. This is a typical representation of a spring, uh, a natural spring, um, and sort of rivers of water are flowing out of them. And in, if you look at the baseline, that baseline is also a representation of a river flowing through a rocky landscape, perhaps a mountain or gorge. And um, so, um, and two um, water buffaloes then are drinking from these sources of the, of the river. Um, the seal is also inscribed with the name of its owner, Shar Kali Shari, um, the king of Akkad and Ibn Sharum, the scribe, his servant. So what we're looking at is the main uh, the seal of the scribe of the of the Akkadian uh, Akkadian king. Here I present to you um, some examples of such mythological tales. The one on top left, for instance, is the seal of Adda, um, and uh, the scribe possibly uh, from uh, Sippar in southern Iraq. Uh, there's an inscription that um, identifies his name. Um, on it, as you can see it on top left, and um, it's also, it's carved out of green stone, and it's about inch and a half thick. Um, and the seal of Adda depicts five gods. Now, if you look at the representation, wearing pointed headdresses with multiple horns, um, identifying them as divinities. Um, uh, we see a deity with streams of water. Um, and fishes emerging out of his shoulders um, on the towards the right, um, and you can the second from the right, um, and we can identify him as Ea, uh, the god of wisdom and water. Uh, depicted behind him is Usmu, 
Um, we recognize him because he has two faces in the front and the back. Um, another divinity uh, with, has rays emerging from his shoulders. He's r rising from behind the mountains in the middle. And that's, and, and that's Shamash, the sun rising behind the mountains. Um, and that's sun god uh, Shamash. And in the middle, um, facing us um, with wings, with outstretched wings, is the goddess Ishtar. Um, and frontally depicted goddess, and it's really easy to identify Ishtar. So um, I'm saying that there is this, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling this as a kind of an example how this rich iconography of identifying particular gods and goddesses um, become very uh, important in this kind of range of uh, seals. Next, I'd like to talk about some extraordinary developments in uh, particularly in portraiture and metallurgical technology, in bronze working particularly, and the invention of the hollow cast lost wax method. Um, this copper alloy head of a ruler that was found was found in Nineveh. Uh, in, in the sort of northern part of Mesopotamia in uh, today's Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and it's one of the, perhaps one of the most extraordinary finds actually from this time period and illustrates a new conception of a very confident kingship, but also an excellent example of these kind of new metal metallurgical technologies that became available to craftsmen in, during the Akkadian period. This uninscribed over life size uh, head of a ruler, um, it's, it's about 14 inches tall, and um, has a serene and powerful and confident fig uh, features um, in his facial expression that are um, elaborately detailed, extremely elaborately detailed, all his facial features. His eyes would have been inlaid with precious stones, but were gouged out in, uh, in antiquity. So some art historians have speculated that the fact that his eyes were gouged out may have been an act of iconoclasm, um, provoked by the extremely um, sort of controversial aspects of uh, the rule of um, uh, Naram Sin in particular uh, among these Akkadian kings, but this is uh, largely uh, speculation. This uh, copper alloy head is the earliest uh, known example of this method that we call lost wax hollow casting technology, um, which seems to have been the innovation of this particular time period. So I'd like to tell you a little bit how that was done. It's illustrated here, uh, you can see the various phases of um, uh, in this production, and this is uh, an illustration taken from Zeynep Bahrani's uh, chapter that we're reading this week, uh, that uh, the lost wax method involves first modeling the he head in clay, uh, that's the first image here, and then covering that clay head with a uh, layer of wax, a uh, kind of a really um, um, uh, a consistent thickness um, wax um, in the second step. Then um, what the artist does is re they rebuild another clay layer on top of the wax, covering that and, and sort of really connecting um, the two layers of, of wax by uh, these, uh, these, uh, these little inserts. Um, so once that is completed, the whole thing is then um, uh, heated and the wax actually um, melts. Um, so uh, when you turn it upside down and you pour uh, the molten metal into the hollow space that is left uh, out, uh, empty by the uh, heated wax, and gives away, uh, gives way to the molten metal. Uh, the technique allows a really, and then, and then you remove the outside clay, 
Um, and what you have is, um, is of course, the, um, the, the metal, that, which is then completed by polishing uh, and, so, um, and adding the details um, on the outside. So um, you can see how the final details were then added. With, uh, with further polishing. The sprues are sawn off, the sprues that connect the two, um, uh, two layers, um, and then the art object is polished and then it is uh, finished. This uh, next metal statue uh, we have is Basetki statue. It was found in the town of Basetki in Iraq um, in 1971. It's a copper alloy statue of a nude male standard bearer, uh, he a hero we know uh, from uh, various um, uh, seal impressions, and I, I show you one on the right, so you can sort of have imagined what uh, the, the complete version would have looked like. Um, the top part of the body, of course, is, uh, is missing, unfortunately. The attention to details of the physical aspects of the body, the musculature, is extremely careful and naturalistic, including the depiction of musculature, of calves and thighs, um, and it has a perfectly preserved inscription as well that, de uh, that gives us um, an account of the uh, nine victories of Naram Sin in a single year. Uh, in a kind of an analytic account um, and the idea that the people of Agade built uh, a temple for the king, um, which is um, taken by art historians, art, um, ancient historians, as an important evidence for the divinization of this particular king, um, whose name is written from here onwards um, with a divine determinative, just like the gods. So I'd like to end my lecture by, uh, by talking about two stone objects. Um, one sculpture in the round um, is, this is a statue of the Akkadian king Manish Tushu. Um, although uh, about half of the statue is missing. It's roughly life-sized. Um, it was carved out of diorite. It's a very expensive, very important, very shiny sort of um, uh, uh, stone that is very hard volcanic stone um, that was uh, brought in from Oman, um, where the uh, um, Mesopotamian kings are actually um, mining for copper. Uh, this was um, found in Susa, and it must have been carried there um, by the Elamites in the 12th century alongside with all the other monuments. Um, it's preserved waist down. Manish Tushu has a folding gown, and there's this kind of really softness. It's really amazing, this softness of his gown with the, its fringes, you can see, are uh, extremely well detailed. Um, his hands are... Um, his hands are um, surviving, um, and they are clasped in a gesture of prayer, um, and it is inscribed with a beautiful calligraphic inscription on his uh, on his skirt, uh, on his gown, um, and um, and so looking at all of these details and the naturalism, we're actually really understand we're dealing with a highly skilled craftsmanship. Um, here. And the final object that I want to tell you about is this uh, also belongs to Manish Tushu, um, the same king, um, uh, and this is the obelisk of Manish Tushu, which is a large quadrilateral obelisk, uh, an obelisk-shaped stone inscribed with a, a beautiful calligraphic land contract. Um, and so um, it records the purchase of eight large fields in Babylonia by Manish Tushu. Um, and like the statue, uh, then this is also carved out of diorite. Um, and this really impressive work, um, sort of an important monument, also uh, sort of monumentalizes, as, as, um, as Zainab Bahrani argues, the act of a land transfer into um, builds it into a kind of a uh, royal monument. So this uh, completes my uh, 
third lecture, um, and I really um, look forward to um, discussing um, these monuments um, as well as the whole idea of public monument um, on Thursday. So thank you so much.